four o'clock, like they do the four o'clock. And then you know what they do to us people that can't do the four o'clock? They post these four o'clock gratitude pictures on social. I'm not that person. I'm not that person. Just just rub it in your face, right? Like, holy cow. That's brutal. I wasn't always a four o'clock person. I used to be a bartender and a waitress. I was a late late nighter, but you know, you get older, things change, jobs change. Yeah. Well, so it's four it's, o'clock it's, used to be when I was going to bed, not when I was getting. I, up. you know what? I, <laughs> I remember those. I remember those. I got a book coming out in December, and I'm starting to tell those stories. Of and we all know everyone's got a ton of those. If you grew up in the industry, those stories, and they're all kind of coming back now yeah. that I'm starting to maybe open up that mind again. <laughs> those memories. Oh boy, yeah. Four o'clock was early sometimes to go home. Right, it was five o'clock, six o'clock, the sunrise. See people going to work. <laughs> You're going home. Uh huh. Yeah, I do yeah, remember those days. Remember those. I'm really glad there wasn't social media when I was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone didn't have a camera on their phone back then. Do you know how many people say that? There are so many people that say that nowadays. That are are you know our age going? Thank God. Thank God. It's so tough for kids now, though. And I shouldn't even say kids. My kids are thirty. <laughs> Even they didn't have it as bad as the ones that do now. Like it just must be, you got to watch everything. You just you got to be careful. Well, it, you got to watch what you're saying, what you're doing. This is, it's, it, it's, it's mind blowing what they have to do and deal with. And um, they live with them glued to their hands. Like do not. I like, think that's switching though. Like I do. Like, do you think so? I, I know that I have three sons and none of them are on social and never really were. And they are not glued to their phones. And then really? That's huge, phones. though. And they're all in the industry, too. Um, really? No. And they were, I, and then I was watching some things about, what are they calling it? Where they're, like, they go on long flights, and they're not, you know, using their phones or watching the videos oh, yeah. and all that stuff. And I'm like, oh, good. I think people are, like, I think they're, like, kind of sick of it, some of them. So. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I um. I think social media though used to up and maybe it's, is it? Yeah, it's up. Like they say, do, do you hear? I'll, I got some cool stats when I, cause I, I do training on this stuff. Do you know, here we go. This will blow your mind. Nineties. And this is Canadian. 97% of Canadians are on social media every day. Guess for how long? An hour. The length of the Godfather movie, part one. Was that three hours? Two hours and 48 minutes okay. a day. <laughs> That's, and, but also then what's the social media? Well, it's like TikTok or Instagram, Facebook, all those channels. Yeah, like I'm Anyone? on LinkedIn, so I'm technically on social media. There you go. There you go. So, you know, like I'm like, is there some kind of social media that isn't like TikTok or Instagram or, you know, like, I don't know. Like, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Isn't that crazy though? That is crazy. So if there I, is a well, movement. Go down that, I think it's, I, I, cause it happens to me. Who are we kidding? Like where you go down this rabbit hole and you're like, how did I get lost for an hour and a half on nonsense? And then. You're, Isn't oh it amazing? God. Yeah. Do you find it amazing? Like you sit in a meeting and I'm sure you've sat in millions of meetings that you sit in a meeting for an hour and you're like, you kind of waiting and looking at the clock. You can blow through an hour on social media in like a blink of an eye. Yeah. Right. It's bizarre. Like I actually deleted all of my social media off of my phone because I did find myself getting sucked in. I'm like, why? I don't care. Like, I don't need a new recipe. Like, what? (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's this, there's like all these things like they talk about like late night swiping now, like is a problem is like an addiction. Yeah. Like late night, like if you have this addiction, you have these problems. I'm like, holy cow, they're starting to categorize me and all these other people that are out there. It is insane. It's insane. I hope it gets better. I hope you're on to something. I hope uh, it gets better. Because, I'm, you know, did you hear about this other thing? So totally off topic of everything about, I want to talk about you more, but have you seen that the WHO has just put out this warning about loneliness? Uh-huh. No, I haven't seen it, but I'm not surprised. There's this whole thing right now of people being alone that it's actually impacting our healthcare. Yeah. How, 
loneliness is what kills people. That's what they said. The number one killer is loneliness. Yeah. It's loneliness and it's not getting better. And um, not that it's a shame, shameless plug of my book, but my book is called Alone in Hospitality. But it is, there's this big movement of people trying to kind of group together and, and start to talk. <laughs> Like, can you believe it that we actually are going to probably see w webinars on how to have a conversation or how to talk to people? But it makes perfect sense to me. Like, we just went so far the other way. There is also this doctor or academic in New York. And it and I was listening. I don't know. I think his name's Scott something. But it is um, men. It's really impacting men. This loneliness thing like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody, but then I can't even remember all the stats he was saying. I'm like, oh my God, as a mother of three sons, I'm like, oh my gosh. But um, they work well, in hospitality. They're, you know, they're very. <laughs> but, but it is, but it is those things like when you think about men, they tend not to be like open with their emotions as much. And maybe I can see that being, a, it's, it's no different than I think, well, not different. Maybe it is, but when there is eating, like men have eating challenges or eating problems yeah. as well. Right. And a lot of people kind of dismiss that. It's like, no, they do too, yeah. right? It's, yeah, yeah. So, well, well, thanks again for spending time with us. And it's a complete honor to have you on our show. And I was, I, I always see your posts. So first of all, we got to clear some things up. You're very active on social media. So thank you. On LinkedIn. <laughs> on LinkedIn, yes. On LinkedIn, that's it. <laughs> yes, on LinkedIn, right? But you, you, what you're doing with Second Harvest and, I remember seeing you at a conference I was at, at Cisco's conference, um, oh. calling this out, which was good. I, I remember you were, uh, and I've been doing that conference for 14 years. Out of the 14 years of the first time that you called someone out, you called this out on how we should be supporting more and, and providing this shift in the industry, supporting more places like Second Harvest and what you do. And I was sat there in the audience going, well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. I I like I, I remember it so clear because it was like wow, that was awesome. But I think what you're doing, and I see your post all the time, and you're educating a lot of people. Like like your education isn't your edu. I always say edutainment. You're educating us, and is really, I guess it gets to us. It it, it resonates is what I'm trying to say. So I just want to thank you for taking the time and spending with us. I, hey man, restaurant guy, I, like my whole life is restaurants. I love restaurants. Like I am an, I'm an interesting CEO in HR. I'm like, if they have bartender or waitress or waiter or server on their resume, you want to snap them up. You just, you know, cause I know what that's like. I know the skills mm -hmm. They we don't get enough credit in this industry. But, and these are such transferable skills. You have to learn how to be in the weeds and deal with multiple personalities. Like there is no better training ground for any job, in my opinion, than working in service. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a tough gig, and and they and yeah. they it's all it's <laughs> well, you're in trouble. But it's like the hospitality army that people get into, and this you have to have thick skin to stay in the yeah. industry too, and to operate businesses and and to move forward with it. So. I totally get it. it. It's I agree with you. You have to snap those people up. But I want to talk more about you, Lori. I want to learn more about you. You've you've just now. I remember when you got awarded the Ontario. Tell me if I'm getting this right. The Order of Ontario Award. Yes. What, what is that? Oh, that well, sounds really important. It is the highest civilian honor you can get in Ontario. I'm kind of a big deal. You know? big the Governor General gave it to me. Serious. Serious? Oh no, it's actually a pretty. I know, but like I said, I like no, I've got my homework here. I well, I remember seeing the post about it. I remember, um, I remember you getting it, and I was like, wow. It was. So I was like, wow. Honor. It was. It's a huge honor. But I mean, how did you find out? How did you find out? They call you? Yeah, they must have called me. No, I think they emailed me. Actually, yeah, they emailed me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What was that like? What was that like? Cool. It was very cool. I was very. It's a very proud moment. Yeah. Like, it was, it was, it's awesome. It's really awesome. And it's not about the recognition. It just feels like where I came from to where I was. It was like, I couldn't have planned this trajectory of my life. And so really that I have it means anybody could have it, quite frankly. Like, 
I'm no better than anybody else. We're all awesome. So. Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't fucking agree with you. I think you're incredible in what you do. Oh, we're, we're all incredible. Like, yeah. I don't think I'm unique. I think so many but, of us. But are, people but, all, but you have, I, like I always say this, and, and, and I, I think, I think what you do, you inspire others. Then I think that ma- that makes you incredible is how you inspire others to do things like you do with Second Harvest. And I think that's important that we honor those people and put them on, give them an award like that, which is <laughs> crazy pin, cool. A pin they can wear everywhere they go. <laughs> that's got to be really cool, though. I, I'm, I'm completely honored on that. So, how did you, first of all, how did was this was this on your map of journey of career choices was to be the CEO of a Second Harvest? Of was it, no, was it, it wasn't in that grade ten. Let's find out what your career job's going to be in the future. No. I'm a high school dropout, man. <laughs> now you're getting the top honor. No wonder. I did go back and get my GED, so I did graduate. Okay, okay. Um, but yeah, no, not at all, not at all. I was, I really, I, I've been working in uh, hospitality since I was 14. You know, Mother's Pizza started there, and. Uh, and then just you know bartended and 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 waitressed at different bars, and because the money was great, it was the eighties, it was wonderful, it was also a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. And then I um, I got married very young, and I had children very young, like well not very young, but I was twenty one, twenty three, and twenty six when I by the time I'd had three. So in today's world, that's young. Right? In today's world, that's that's young. But I mean, in my parents' world, I wasn't young. So yeah, um, but it was pretty young and uh and so that's why i went back and got my gd because i remember thinking oh well i can't tell my son he has to graduate from high school if i didn't so i <laughs> so that's when i got back and i went to college for a couple of years for computer science because i was looking at the the job like the the paper when you looked at the paper for jobs and everybody was wanting computers and i'm like oh i should do that so i did graduate as a systems analyst in, from college but i'm like wow i'm not a coder even though i can code not my personality type wow. so yeah so I started there but then I was you know I had this kind of uh, horrible moment in my life where my husband left and I was low income and I had three sons that were very young that I had to mm-hmm. feed and house and my husband had left and he had we were ten thousand dollars in arrears in the rent which I had no idea about and I mean I was working I was working at the bar I've always been working at a bar and so that was like oh my like this catalyst kind of this moment of, ah. uh, so I was working at this bar called slip Mahoney's and I said, give me every shift you can give me. And I was working, like, I, I remember sleeping on that floor and they were so great. Tiny little hole in the wall, Irish pub. We had bands. It was like, cool. Um, but at the same time, the, ch- the child nutrition program at my son's school, they didn't have one. They wanted one. And they asked me if I would run it. And I said, you betcha. Cause I needed actually to feed my own kids. So I started, feeding all the kids and essentially becoming a small entrepreneur, right? Cause you have to find the money because it wasn't, they didn't give you money. You have to get mm-hmm. staff except for not staff. You can't pay them. So it's volunteers. You have to understand health inspections. You have to buy, literally go out and shop the food. You have to make sure you have a menu that people will actually eat that, you know? So wow. it really was this great stepping stone for me of becoming a little entrepreneur by accident kind of and and taking those skills and it's like you know through the course of your life you just grow when you're good at something somebody asks you to do more and you know that the best way to grow is or the best way to get something done is to give it to a busy person and I've always been a busy person so that's kind of what happened so then I was working like three jobs can you do this part-time and I was working four jobs and I'm like okay and that's I did that for a few years and then and then I got a job as a director and then another director and then a VP and then la, la, la. now here I am today. <laughs> so, so where did second harvest come in? Like, when, when did that chart? I've been here for 10 years, 10 years. Second, ten, second harvest has been around for 40 years. I think it was 39 years, mm-hmm. uh, but it was a small grassroots charity in North York and Toronto. And, um, I was working at in child nutrition. So my whole life I've been working in, in feeding kids and building community, like teaching really marginalized moms how to run businesses and these student nutrition businesses. So I 
was working, I got asked to work for an organization called Breakfast Clubs of Canada. Um, okay, yeah. And yeah, and because they were fairly new, they were big in Quebec, but they weren't big across the country. But I'd been working at another place called Food Share. So I was, it was a Toronto organization, but there's a lot of great models that I was, we were building across the country. And they said, come work for us. We need, we need to build out um, Breakfast Club of Canada across the country. And the job was like, yeah, go to different governments and ask for their data and tell them you can give them money. It wasn't like a terribly hard job, mm -hmm. right? Like <laughs> I had friends across the country. I'm like, how can I help you feed your children? So I did that for a while, but then I was just traveling so much. And I was like, my gosh, Laurie, you, your kids are all grown up and you're not seeing them. Like you're not, <laughs> you got to be better. So I'm like, I, so I scaled that one. I scaled another organization nationally and then I'm like okay I need to go back locally let's just go to a nice local place and so I got this job and it was close and then of course because of my history I'm like ah eh, this is a good idea but we need to actually fix it this could be national <laughs> this could be this this could be that and so that's the way I looked I just changed the whole vision and I and and also like it was great it was feeding people but it wasn't really like it's about food waste, right? Like this mm -hmm. problem. We've got a big food waste problem. So we're not a food bank. Let the food banks do what they do. They do a great job. Let's like get our, carve our own space out, and that's food waste. So that you got to give us some stats, or because I've heard some of the stats from you before. They're outrageous. And what was yeah, more outrageous? This is this is, this is mind blowing. It is mind blowing, but the outrageous part is that we didn't have the data. So when it, like I'm here, I'm like, okay, so how much waste is there in Canada? There wasn't any data, so it was second harvest that found the money to get the actual research done and then we learned uh, by hiring a value chain management international 58 percent of all the food produced for canadians is lost or wasted 58 percent and now some of that is unavoidable but of the avoidable it's like 32 percent of that so like 11.2 million metric tons so enough to feed every canadian for like four or five months for free what? yeah so how do we, and, and there's a piece of like, people are literally hungry in our country that need food, but also this food is going to landfill where, where it's creating methane gas, which is a direct contributor to the climate crisis. Like just, it's not like, it's silly. This is such a common sense thing. Like, okay, well, let's take this food and make sure we give it to people and, and manage that while we work on some policy interventions so that none of this has to happen at all. Like, I mean, if you've heard me say this, I don't think most charities should exist. Charities <laughs> exist where policy doesn't. If we had good policy, we so wouldn't true. exist. So I'd much rather we fix the problem than then just keep band-aiding this thing. Like let's And that's what it. charities is, is the band-aid, right? Like it's that exactly. band-aid approach. Exactly. Right. Now is there is it is it so I like we I work with a lot of restaurants and stuff like this, and we'll talk about that connection back. But is it ever like do you see a day that this is never needed do you ever like in maybe 10 20 years 100 years or whatever you think we'll ever get there Lori? which part that well, second like people yeah. don't need to eat or that there no. won't be food waste <laughs> that there won't be food waste like we'll, we'll finally figure it out well like i know it's a tough I'm question saying, it's not i mean it's not because this is my space and i work yeah. in it and like i think the will is there i think most here's the truth Nobody produces food, nobody buys food, nobody manufactures food, nobody sells food because they want to throw food away. That's a fact. Nobody's in is like, yes, let's get this food and chuck it. Having said that, it's not an individual responsibility. It's a systems issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so the system is broken. We have a broken food system for many reasons. Um, so yes, do I think this is fixable? 100%. But you need to have the will to fix it. And you need the government will to fix it. So even in Canada, uh, we have made a commitment to the UN. We made it in 2015 to half food loss by half, by 2030. Half it. Well, if the only person or organization that's actually measuring it is this charity called Second Harvest, how do you have something that, does, that you're not actually measuring? So if government decides to have the will 
to follow through was, okay, we must mandate measurement. We must hit these targets. Mm -hmm. We should support small and mid-sized businesses with whatever resources they need. If you're a big, huge business, you can pay for it yourself. But Canada's small, mid-sized businesses, let's help them to get to this place where they can mitigate as much as they can. There'll never be none. There'll always Mm -hmm. be some. That's just the food system. But there shouldn't be this amount. Is there other countries in the world that have eliminated this waste or, or is there anyone better or is like, is there worse countries? Where do we fall in? No, we're bad. We're really we're bad. bad? Okay, we're, okay. Yeah, we're, we're right up there. And I would say, not, I would say the truth <laughs> is the challenge with Canada and food waste is we are a huge country. So we like mm-hmm. land mass wise. So yeah. we are unique that way. We're interventions that work in smaller organ countries won't work for us because we're so, like getting food from A to B mm-hmm. is enormous. We don't have manufacturers in different places anymore. Like, you know, manufacturing has done this. So we would need different interventions for sure. Um, there's some places like South Korea uh, does an amazing thing with household waste where you got to pay to play. And so you have to weigh your household waste. And you Shut don't up. Serious? Yeah. So they were like, I think they dropped it by 90%. What? Household. I know. So, but again, there are small, pla- like they're not small. There's a lot of people, but just geographically different, politically different. So can we just take that and move it over here? Not as easily. Yeah. Because we don't have anything harmonized in Ontario, never mind across the country, uh, you know, for mm-hmm. organics. But so is there, is there, is it a part, part of the culture too of Canada? Yes. Like, yeah. It's part of it's a part of the culture. We want everything perfect. And- we want everything perfect. Like um, you know, I was just in Portugal and I'm at a grocery store and I'm looking at the shelves and I'm and that's what the shelves I want to see. They're not full of food. The apples are, you know, they have the little spots on them and everything. So of course I'm gonna pick the ones I want the most, but yeah. they don't give you the option to have only great food. It it's great food. It's fine. Like it's totally yeah. great food. Yeah. It's just not this perfect picture perfect picture perfect and and also we have really interesting specifications so we think of it as like ugly f- fruits and vegetables we've been yeah. told this nonsense that's not what this is about this is about specifications on uh say a tomato so yeah. i have a tomato uh but my burger business is mcdonald's so i need my tomato to be this size well i have enough tomatoes so i don't want those tomatoes anymore can you take them a and w well, no, because our tomato needs to be this size. So there's some specification stuff that is just nonsensical that wow. uh, like there's potato growers that have to grow a certain size potato in the summer and a different size in the winter. And they do it. But it's what? <laughs> there's just a, what? I know that like food is it. So it's not like us as individuals, although everybody's pointing a finger. Well, we do. No, it I was going to say it feels like you wouldn't want this. Well. We want this because we're used to having it now. But yeah. there was a time when that wasn't was, the case. I was going to ask that. When did that shift? When did we shift? Because I always, one of my chefs used to always say, you know, 100 years ago, Jay, everything was organic. That was well, his, that's his line, right? But it, when did that whole thing shift that everything had to be so perfect? Was it in the 50s after the war? Well, probably. Probably. Yeah. I mean, like best before dates came in in the 70s. And I would say, like, I'm born. Did I'm, they? Yeah. So there was a time there wasn't best before stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they're nonsense. Don't even get me started on best before days. <laughs> oh, my Lord. So much waste. Um, I, I hate them. Like, I hate them, too. I hate them, too. They're, they're nonsense. They're just ridiculous and, and such a waste. They waste so much food. And, and so I'm working on policy and pushing the government. We are like, nice. That's, we need to stop this. But I think what happened is we... we the more urban we become, the less, the more removed we are from our food. And so yeah. food has become a commodity and it's not, you know, when I grow something in my garden and my garden is this tiny, it always tastes better, right? Like, and it's yeah. mine and I'm never going to waste that. When I'm not as close to my food, I don't think so much about wasting it. Not me personally, because it's my brain. I don't think about wasting it, but in general, that's kind of the thought is, and, and we're in abundance of, we're an abundant society. The like North America and the West, we are used to having lots of everything. Like, why should you have fresh strawberries in January? You mm-hmm. shouldn't. Like, 
you don't appreciate them anymore because you have them all year. So it's better to have them in the summer when they're the best and they're growing close to you. Do you know what we used to, we used to say in, in the restaurant industry and the reference that we did, because in the back of kitchens and stuff like this, they misuse food. A lot of the times it's misused or it's in cut, it's in, cut improperly and whatever yeah. the case is, it increases their waste. We used to always use the reference of the toothpaste. When you get your toothpaste bottle at the beginning, you're like, ah, and you're just like squeezing it on. You don't really care. It hits the counter, whatever. And you screw that on. But you get to near the end of it, it when you got a little bit oh. left, you're like totally like trying to figure out. You scroll up the thing and you got, you're figuring out, you're squishing as much as you can and everything else. That's how we used to say to restaurants. What part of the toothpaste are you at with your with the way you handle your waste or your food in the back, right? And and a lot yeah. of people don't they take it like you said they take advantage of it you know they misuse it or mistreat it, and it, it's sad. Now, do you have stats on how much food restaurants throw away? Of course I do. Right I know in you front do. of me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nine uh, percent, and that's hotels, restaurants, and institutions. So. Uh, of the of the whole amount, and I would say, you know, so the truth is, quick serve more than full serve. Wait, quick serve is okay. Let me rephrase that. Sorry. So full serve, the waste happens, but typically yeah. the waste is happening. It's plate waste. It's not necessarily back of the house. Oh. I mean, it's not the house too, but true, true. You can manage plate waste if you serve mm-hmm. less. So it, it's a business problem. But plate waste is the bigger piece really so, so restaurants are over portioning yeah yeah but i mean come on we know that we know we that know, well well <laughs> south of the border we're not going to point fingers oh brutal <laughs> so bad so bad but it's like but we do it here too like yeah, I, yeah. I, I i i go out quite frequently and i always got a tough work container i'm like i can't eat a salad this i can't i don't yeah. want to either and i can't eat anything that is usually the the size that it comes to me wow we're just, we're just used to getting it. And like, when did that happen? When did portion sizes become so out of control, right? Like they never, well, used- they never used to be right. No. Like it wasn't that the value was based in the quantity. It was on the quality of the, on the quality. Yeah. It wasn't on the quantity. Right. And you know, I'm going to say you can probably thank a little bit of the, uh, the eighties to that. I think, I think that, I think that was the eighties yeah. that that happened. Right. The gluttony of the eighties. <laughs> it's good times. It was good times. It was good times. I had a lot of fun in the eighties. Not gonna lie. So, does Second Harvest influence the rest of Canada as well? Are you guys across Canada? We are. Yep. And then, how much? Like, how? Like, what's what's that like? To know, like, it's incredible. First of all, but it must be very powerful to also bring Canada together with a brand like that. Like, you're you're kind of I don't want to say you're not franchising it but you're aligning everyone on the same goals. Yeah. We're just really trying to be that one-stop shop. So if you're a business that has surplus food, just call us. We will find it home for it. We say yes to everything and we do it a couple ways. So, so when I started, I said, we like, we're this tiny little charity in Toronto, maybe doing, I don't know, $2 million a year. Now we're like a $260 million organization um, working coast to coast to coast. And we do that. And we're smart about it too, right? Like here we have a fleet and warehouse. Well, does it make sense to have fleet and warehouses across the country? No, because we did the research because my background was low income and I know I didn't get food from a food bank was, okay, let's identify everywhere that is actually giving out free food or, or low cost food. Uh, that's a nonprofit. And there's mm-hmm. 61,000 charities and nonprofits in Canada doing that. 61,000. 61,000? 61,000. There's about 4,700 or 5,000 food banks. So it's like 5,000. Five oh my God. Yeah. So there's a ton of infrastructure already built in. So let's use what exists. So the, like, why would we do that? And we also built an app. And I was going to say, I was going to see, I remember having you on, it was during COVID. I think we, we met on a show and you were just, I think you were just getting it going. I recall. Yeah. We, like, we hey, tell me about this app. Cause this is brilliant. This app, uh, I love this app. So we built it in 2017, I think, and we launched it in Toronto, and then we were piling it in Ontario in 2019. 
Um, and then we just went to BC. And we're like, okay, we've got this great, smart three-year plan. We'll roll it across the country. We'll do all the smart things. And then COVID, boom. And we were like, okay, well, you know, restaurants that were, had all this food they couldn't use. I'm like, okay, how do we get this food? I remember this. Make sure it gets to places. And we also had all this money. I'm like, can we use this app for this to get it out? We, we created something called the Canadian Food, the Food Rescue Canadian Alliance. So it was like industry, government, nonprofits, um, all getting and, and northern and indigenous communities. Where where's the big gaps going to be, and where are the big not gaps? Like where's the food going to be? And so you know there was a lot of eggs, there was a lot of seafood, there was all the stuff that would be typically served in a restaurant um, that people don't often buy a lot of at home. So we got on that right away, and it was there's an app. Get on the app, and the app is really just a matchmaker of here's the food sends out this this uh, notification we have x y and z where do you want it and the charities will go yes or no depending on if they have the capacity what kind of facility they have mm -hmm. they, like, they have lift gates do they have enough that can take skids or can they only take sandwiches and so that's what happened and so we're just connecting all this food across the country directly to charities that need it and and supporting with logistics because when there's big food, we're like, okay, we can get a truck here, we can get a truck there, let's move, the, like, get the food moved around. And it has been life changing for this whole country in terms of really simple access to food that wasn't available. And it's food we don't pay for, right? This is yeah. food that's going into landfill. Then this is like we focus on perishable protein, dairy, and produce because those are the food categories people need when they're low income. They're expensive. Mm -hmm. They go bad quicker. So, like, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. That's pretty cool. Is it, it's available across Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody what, can What here. city doesn't do a good job that we need to call them out? Every city does a great job. I, I say, <laughs> I here's, I say, say who, so who here's just the need to do more? <laughs> we just need to, the, the truth is we just do need to do more. So okay. part of the challenge is, you know, there's, there's, so much need. The need is endless. So we could have 10,000 charities on it. I think we support 5,000 right now. But unless you have the food in the pipeline, it doesn't mean anything. So mm -hmm. what we really are doing now is like, we need to get way more food. And last year, I think we were at 83 million pounds of food uh, that we got through the app. And so every year, it's like 10 million pounds more, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But we still need way more. And so we did some other research to figure out, okay, how much food is actually even being donated in Canada and from all the businesses? And we learned yep. it's 4%. And it's not to us. It's just 4% in general. I'm like, okay, well, that seems like there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go get some more food. And then trying to understand the barriers. Like, why are people not donating? A, is it just part of it is just they don't know, which is a huge part of it. They just don't know. And then there's like, People believe that there's legislative, you know, they're going to get sued. That's not a thing. We are all protected in Canada and in the States. Nobody's ever been sued. Everybody, you can donate your food. Um, but uh, then there's brand, right? Like, so yeah, I, I'm safe. I'm not going to get sued, but it's my brand. I got to protect my brand. I don't yeah. want anybody getting sick. We're a business. We're second harvest. We operate just like Sobeys and Loblaws or any big business. Mm -hmm. We follow the same protocols because we have to, because Sobeys and Loblaws are our partners too. So we're yeah, never yeah. going to put anybody at risk ever mm -hmm. because we don't want, we're business. Yeah, we, yeah, no, we it's exactly it right. so, <laughs> so, so there's really no reason not to, I think outside of, do I have the capacity to donate because say I'm a farmer and, you know, farmers don't have a lot of money. They might be a small farm and they can't glean the land because they don't have the labor I'm like, okay, I get that. So let's see if we can pay for the labor because that, that's cool. Wow. We'll that out. Or if there's milk being dumped. Okay, which we know there's milk being dumped. Um, but the problem is packaging. So, okay, how do we package this milk so that you can still- You guys go through all those solutions with them? We try. Sometimes yeah. it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Like milk is an interesting one in terms of we just don't have much manufacturing. So yeah. even if we could pay for it, there's no facility to do it because they're all just doing- the jobs that they need to be doing to meet their own quotas with supermarkets or yeah. whatever. So yes, we are all about solutions. How can we get your food? 
Wow. Now, okay, for restaurants out there, can restaurants join this app? Are you kidding me? Of course we have. I have this number because I said, hey, guys, how many restaurants do we have on? So currently how, how have many? nearly 60 restaurant businesses registered with 1,500 locations across the country, 1.3 million pounds of food last year alone. Uh, 90% of the rescue food comes from quick serve, such as A&W, Chick-fil-A, and Starbucks. They're, I think they were the top three last year. And but Starbucks. And Starbucks. So like you don't you got have, a lot of room to grow. You got you, so you much food. room to grow. But yeah. I'm like, if Starbucks is going to use our app, trust me, you can use they our know app. What, what I mean? Like, <laughs> so now they don't have to be a chain. They can just be an independent. No, no, no. Does it matter? No. It's, well, uh, I think we got some work. We got in the West here. I know we have 41,000 restaurants. That's just in the West. That's on you guys in Ontario. This is the West. See what I mean though? Like 4% is donating. So it, it seems small, but then when you think about the actual number of businesses, it's not like no. there's so much more opportunity there. So yeah, we should get every restaurant on this. Every no restaurant wants to be throwing away food. There's also no they don't. No, they don't. And, and and you know what? I think it's I think it's like call like here's what I think we need to do, and maybe I'm wrong here, but we need to not only educate them, let them know. So we'll do that. We'll do that through my show and through my channels, but we'll also make sure to um to try to help them understand the cultural shift so instead of just throwing it out think twice right use this app and i think that's i think that's pretty like it sounds simple in, in, in theory but i think we can do that like there's no reason why you can't tell me there's thirty thousand restaurants on this and i think yeah, that'd make a big difference we need to get them on like it's not as simple as go on the app to be fair yeah. like yeah you know, you're at the end of the night you you know, you're not going to get a charity to come pick up your food at one o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock at night. So you have to go, okay, I need to store this for the night. They'll come tomorrow between 10 and whatever new, not during your rush hour, obviously, but so there's that bit that is a little bit of extra work, but once you manage that piece, it's, it is, it's like clockwork. And, and the I truth just is, say, Laurie, it's no different than a linen company, <laughs> right? It is no different than your linen company. Exactly. It helps people. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. So yes, please get on the app. There's definitely a charity in your neighborhood that would benefit from this food and nonprofit in your, and the thing, it's the right thing to do, let alone feeling good about it. It's the right thing to do. I, yeah, it's the right thing to do, but I think restaurants typically want to do the right thing, right? Like, yeah, 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 they, yeah, they do. They, typically <laughs> they're not going against things. <laughs> so, look, I'm just going to make it as easy as possible for you too. Very easy. Yeah. We also understand, like, you're busy. This is not your core business. It's our core business. So we're going to make it super, super easy for you to do it. Doesn't cost them anything. That's that. the biggest question. It doesn't cost them anything, does it? It doesn't cost them a thing. So it doesn't cost you a restaurant uh, a thing. That's not fair, actually. To be to be truthful, okay. Okay. depending on your business, it might cost you the takeout container. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, not necessarily, but if you're All passionate right. Then there is there could be a cost. That's okay. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I, think, I, I think they'll be okay. Cost, but it's and, and also like it's an 80 20 rule, like everything else. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna pick a charity in your neighborhood who's yeah. gonna grant it, and they're just gonna come every day or every week or whenever you decide to have it. So once that starts happening, like the app is so great in terms of you just put it in, it'll be a reoccurring donation. It will tell you how many meals you provide, it will tell you the value of the food you provide, it will tell you. Uh, the greenhouse gases that you've diverted, it will tell you the water you've saved. It gives you great data. Plus, if you are a franchise, you can roll it all up into one spot. So like this is my company. Yeah. These are all the locations. So you can, the person at the location can see it, but you can also roll up all the data so you can see what's happening as a, as a bigger organization. We've made this super, super simple. Wow. Well, Lori, we'll do... Like I'll do what we can do at our for our show and for our reach, which we do reach a lot of restaurants and, and folks across the country in the United States. Are you training the U.S. folks to do this kind of thing too? There are some great things already happening in the states. Okay. Uh, the states is a, it's a, a different. We've had oh. people ask us if we would white label it to places in the states and in the yeah. UK and actually different places across the globe. <laughs> to be honest, and 
and it's something we're looking at doing now. Like, yeah, I think we can. So, sure. so this, we will offer this up if people in different parts of the world would like to use it. Now, this is a bizarre question in a sense, because I, I don't know if it is, but is like, first of all, I'm just blown away what you do and what you guys do. Is there ever, because this is coming up in a lot of conversations around technology. Is there ever, does AI ever play a role in this? Yes. Okay, here we go. Like, I didn't want to ask you. So I thought it was so bizarre, but does well, it? Of course, AI plays a role in everything. And, and we yeah. are very AI forward. I, like, I, we have an AI advisor. My you whole staff is an AI boot camp. I'm like, we need to be ahead of this. AI is in everything, whether you want to believe it or not. Like, as soon as you're a Microsoft Word, AI is there. Grammarly is AI. Like, AI yeah. is everywhere. So I think there's a little bit of a confusion about what AI is. Yeah. And there's a lot of automation. So like, how do we make automation within the app to make everybody's life a lot easier? So it's not always, there's always going to be people like AI doesn't actually get rid of people. It makes your life easier. So you can do less of the stuff you don't want to do and more of the stuff you do want to do. Um, so yes, there's AI and everything. And we're just, we're just at the beginning of our journey. Although I would still say we're we're ahead of a lot of other places in terms of. Well, this. first of all, you're you're embracing it, which is great. Absolutely. You're learning about. Like I love that. Well, why I say that is, I was at the National Restaurant Association show in Chicago, and I saw AI garbage cans for waste, and they have the cameras that go over the garbage cans. Yeah, yeah. And they're connected. I think IKEA uses them. Yep. And in a few places, and it's recording your garbage yeah. <laughs> into AI, and I'm like. It's brilliant. That was probably the Make coolest thing I saw the whole show. That's not new. Really? Yeah, that food waste audit stuff is not new. Those cameras and and managing your waste that way in restaurants they're not new. So it's almost be mandatory. Mm. Mm -hmm. they're, change they're, a lot of change a lot of habits, right? Exactly, and that's the, the challenge, right? Uh, like, you know better, you do better. So a lot of this is just training and education too. Well, I was I did a talk, Lori, and I'm not going to say the place, but I did a talk last fall in Montreal, say the city, Montreal, and I wanted to show a room of two, three hundred people what waste looked like. Oh, I should send you the pictures, and I said, okay, go grab me the kitchen's garbage, not the waste garbage bins but they're garbage. And we took a table. It's a very fancy place, by the way. And this huge conference, I took a table, we laid out a garbage bag and I dumped the garbage on the table. The amount of stuff, Lori, that was thrown away. That was like, I, I guarantee you those people will never forget into the rest of their lives. That moment on how much food was thrown away that had a couple brown little tinges on the lettuce. The, the piles of bacon that was thrown out that was frozen blocked because it yeah. must have got frozen or whatever were thrown away. They thought it was staged first. And I said, there's no staging here because they could not believe it. I think we worked out to the ability from what we looked at, that was one morning. And it right. was like three or $4,000 with the food they threw out. Right. Look at your like, inventory costs. This is an economically does not make sense for us to throw this no. food away. No, but it was, it was just one of those moments. It was like, I want to show you what it looks like. Here you go. And they all went, you staged it, Jay. I'm like, no, I did it. This is, this is real. This is real. I just grabbed it out of the back. Here's what it is. And I, I just don't think people see it. They don't, but that's because we hide it. Right. Like when you even mm -hmm. think about compost, it's always under something like it's in, in your house. It's in a yeah. cupboard. Like literally we hide it and we've created a system that takes our waste away. So we don't even have to deal with it. So yeah. we don't see it because we've created systems that we don't actually have to. And I a hundred percent, I think what you did was brilliant because if we literally see it, we will stop ourselves. Like yeah. if you had a big glass jar on your counter that said all the waste is going in here and you just look so at that for a little while and you'll go, Oh, well. and then when you start thinking about the money, like that, what bacon, what? That's expensive. Like everything's expensive, but oh my goodness. It was incredible. And it was just, that's what everyone said. And the lady's like, that produce is better. Well, I remember one lady's like, that produce is better than what's in my fridge right now. Mm -hmm. And 
why I say this is a lot of times we hear about, you know, the restaurant challenges that are out there and we hear it every day. You know, this one's having a challenge with the food cost and, and this and that with what's happening. And I said, you know, like, there's a lot of things that we need to fix before we start saying that it's completely broken in the industry. And I think one of them is the waste problem that we have. And I think there's a lot of room to grow. I'm just trying to find the picture because it was, it made me think, I didn't even, I didn't know it was going to be that bad. Did, when I, stage this? did I stage this? Maybe I did stage this. No, it was so funny because I actually, I'm going to put it on my LinkedIn tonight. I wish I had a picture. I don't think I've, yeah, it's in here somewhere, but I just think the thing is, is that we need to be more aware of it and be conscious of it, but not just, and I think this is what I love what you do, Lori, is that it's not just talk. <laughs> and I saw that the day that you called us out on that stage. It's not just talk because I'm sure you've seen how many people talk about this and that. It's the action is going to make the difference. Yes. That's the answer. <laughs> it's the action. It's the action, right? The action. We have to collectively act. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Yeah. Oh wow, eh? Look at that, Lori. That's wild. Isn't that, that wild? Was... That's such a good lesson for people too. Look at that chunk of bacon. You know how much of right? bacon? I see it. I see it. <laughs> it was like, are you kidding me? So, anyways. I know it's, I know it's, it's, you have to go home because I'm sure you've been there since early. I have been. I've been, I know, I, I've been I know in you. this office for over 12 hours now. See, exactly. <laughs> oh man, you're awesome. Well, I just want to thank you for taking the time to spend with us. I'm going to put some calls out. I need you to send me everything you can that I can repost for restaurants to get onto this app. And uh, we're going to push it through our channels and make sure everyone puts it on, learns about it, needs to do what they do. We should not, not have any restaurant not having this. And uh, they should, they do, do schools, like do the associations out there in the schools um, learn about this, that they kind of start young? Oh, education. Yeah, yeah. We, do. we have a big training and education um, portfolio here. But actually, to your point, we are about to, I don't know, I'm giving away secrets, but we are actually building out a youth innovation center to do exactly that, right? Like it was, Perfect. we recycle now because our kids shamed us into it. And yep. really the kids that are going to shame everybody into all the good stuff that we should be doing. So yes, and it's, and it's going to grow. I love it. You're amazing. I just want to thank amazing. you. No, thank you for everything you're doing and stuff. And like I said, we'll do what we can. We'll push it out. We're going to, we're going to call everyone out now. And do make it. sure that they, they do Harvest that. Food rescue app. You just have to go to secondharvest.ca, but you can download it on your iPhone or on your Android. Like it's it's available. It's also beautiful. Like you should download it anyway, because it's a, just a beautiful. <laughs> I, I will, because I'm going to show it to everyone that I meet with Excellent. and the uh, people I work with. I'm going to promote it. I'll, I'll promote the bejesus out of it. So Please do. Thank you. I will. That's great. I love I will. that. No, cool. thank you, Lori. You're just amazing. Congratulations on the award as well. I can see why you got it and it's pretty obvious. And uh, thank you again for spending. It means your... nothing to my children. It's so funny. Don't worry. I will never get an ego. Trust me. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm the way I'm the same way. I'm like, Hey, I'm hosting the NRA show in Chicago. They're like, yeah, so what? Children are great humbling. human beings. <laughs> I know they are. They, they plant us pretty good. Pretty good. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Lori. You have okay. a great evening. You too. And all thanks. the best. Thanks. Stay connected too, and we'll keep pushing yeah. out for you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Lori. Bye.